Hello and welcome to Analyse This, Mental Health in Film and TV. I'm your host, Dr Boo, clinical psychologist, and today I'm joined by a clinical psychologist and an actor. And the three of us will be talking about the film Joker. How about another joke, Murray? No, I think we've had enough of your jokes. What do you get? I don't think so. When you cross I think a mentally ill loner with it. a society that abandons him and treats him like trash! Call the police, I'll Gene. tell you what you get! Call the police! You get what you f***ing deserve! My guests are Dr. Kavan Sanger and Dave. Dr. Sanger is a clinical psychologist in the NHS working in a chronic pain service and she's also an associate with Balanced Minds in London. Dave is an actor. We discuss the psychological formulation, the diagnosis and the portrayal of therapy in the film, as well as the acting and physicality of Joaquin Phoenix's portrayal of the Joker. We talk about society and its influence on mental health, as well as some controversial ideas about what that final joke is all about. Well, I'd normally say, so what kind of psychologist are you? Dave, what kind of actor are you? Uh, I mean, I broke one. <laughs> if, if, if it's a pay I go, you know, it's, uh, it's how it works. That is basically how it works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You'll go to any any country, yeah, any yeah. place. Yeah, that's it, really. Yeah. You just give me a time and a date and I'll be there. <laughs> What what do you ideally like doing though? Darling? Oh like, yeah, I, I like I like working in theatre. Oh, okay. I like working in theatre most of all. So the last year is going to have been especially difficult for you. Uh, yeah, it has been a, a challenge. Uh, I sort of I felt the first lockdown was pretty good, you know, always keeping up, doing a list of ten things that I had to do each day, which mm-hmm. was great. The, the second lockdown, that list got shortened to five, and the, the third <laughs> lockdown was just me sat on the sofa eating biscuits. <laughs> 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 but I'd, I'd like to think that it's not just me that 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 was that that happened before. I actually think you were incredibly resilient. Um, and and to be fair, the third lockdown, we decided to do a podcast. So and make paper mache volcanoes. Oh yeah, and we made a papier mache volcano for Easter, and yep. then also one for President Biden's inauguration. I think. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> They're very seasonal. Um, yeah. Yeah, I like that. I uh, yeah, I think for Easter I I watched Aliens because it's it's a, it's got eggs in it, so it's an Easter film. That's amazing. Um, and there's a uh, the the birth of a new creature. Exactly. Birth, rebirth, death. It's it's oh, the whole Easter story right there in a film. And speaking of films, you guys have a podcast a bit similar to this, a little <laughs> bit different to this with the space for all of us. Um tell us a little bit about your podcast. Yeah, so um, we we also analyse films, but through the lens of a psychologist and an actor, the ways in which our job kind of encourage us to both analyse people, look at situations, um, try and make sense of the world, but also then comes with its own slants um yeah it, it's been a fun project what would you, how would you describe it we just chat i think uh, yeah i think i think i think that that's the nice thing it's i think from the last uh last year or so like we just get used to each other's company so we were like right well let's get some other people involved as well so so let's let, let's let's make everyone else listen to us as well and not just not just chat we had our own um, little grandiose moment i think that's what happened yeah that's great. And what's it called? So people can go find it. It's called 3D's Character Assassination. The idea being that I have two doctorates. I have a PhD in neuroscience and I also have a clinical doctorate. And I'm a Dave. <laughs> <laughs> and we all we all need a Dave. We probably every now and then need a Dave in these kind of podcasts like the one I'm doing here because we can often get very into the psychology. So it'd be really interesting to have um, an actor's perspective on this. And what we've discussed is Joker, um, Mm -hmm. the amazing film, Um, having a little chat between the three of us and we decided that was the one to go for. So today's episode is going to be us looking at Joker from these different perspectives. Dave, why don't you give us a quick summary for those listeners who haven't watched it? What is this about? Right. So uh, Arthur Fleck, a cheap clown and and aspiring comedian, is alone in Gotham City for all but his mother, whom he cares for hand and foot. 
After several increasingly severe incidents, he loses his job. On his way home, he is confronted by three privileged bankers on the subway for whom he takes a beating. He shoots and kills them. These two incidents, the firing both figuratively and literally, set Arthur on course to full-on insanity whilst tensions brew throughout Gotham. Arthur eventually is invited onto a popular TV talk show for other reasons, but uses it to reveal his heinous crime. This is the final straw for the city and violence erupts between social classes. And never has this film been more poignant. Mm. Yes. It just it feels like it just gets even more relevant, even more scary since it came out in 2019, really. It just sort of seems like what what nothing more can happen. Oh, oh something else crazy's happened. It just seems like it's been constant over the yeah. last certainly over the last year and a half. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think that that even when it came out, it was very, very controversial as a film, mm. um, just from the perspective of both psychology and, um, well, other things. Let's come on to some criticisms um, in a little bit, but let, let's mm. just talk a little bit, I think, about, um, about this character, about Arthur. Um, we know he's had this rough childhood. We mm. know he's got brain damage. Mm-hmm. Um, and we know that... Oh, and it certainly sort of comes out as the film goes by that, you know, so he's been adopted as far as we are aware, it comes out in the film. And we know he's definitely had a rough childhood. His mother was hospitalised and arrested for child endangerment. Mm. So, and we know that he's brought up in relative poverty because that um, the, the, the class divide in, in Gotham is... Vast. Very huge, huge. Yeah. So for me, the first thing that kind of, makes me think okay what are we dealing with here if we were looking at this person coming into one of our clinics I'm it shouts Mm. developmental trauma to me Um, so with developmental trauma you have these um, individuals who at a very young age have um, fractured lives basically so Mm. if if he was adopted we don't know what age he was adopted and whether there was a difficulty even in his very early life Mm. And then there's this head injury as well. So you said mm-hmm. you have a neuroscience degree. I um I know nothing mm. about head injury. Uh, what are we what are we looking at? Do you think there with with Arthur's head injury and his laughing and that sort of element of his presentation? So so my my neuroscience PhD was actually in ERPs as opposed to MRIs. Um, so I think sometimes, um, yeah, people have this assumption that I should know everything about all the different areas of the brain. I can tell you what time different actions happen in the brain. <laughs> EMPs? ERP, it stands for, sorry, Event Related Potentials. Cool. Sorry. Um, and I, I know no more than before you gave us the definition of that. <laughs> this is this is always really helpful having Dave around because I use an acronyms. I work for the NHS, which is also full of an acronyms. So at least you point out to me when I'm using them. <laughs> I'm like, well, I, I don't know what this word means. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's awesome. Um, so I looked um, at basically it's a measure of electrical brain activity. And certain certain neural connections are going to be made and certain neurons are going to fire at different times after an event. So an event-related potential is when, for example, you've got someone um, with an EEG cap on, so it measures their brain wave, it measures their brain activity. If you then ask them to pick up a cup and then you ask them to put that cup back down, when you give them the instruction, please pick up, please pick up the cup. Certain neurons are going to fire because we then um, need our sort of pre-motor cortex to get involved with sort of thinking about doing this action. We then engage the actual motor cortex to do the action itself. And that's all going to come with certain things happening at different times. So I measure stuff in milliseconds. So Um, it's thinking at 200 milliseconds, you might have one thing, and then you've got a completely different event happening at 300 milliseconds. So, but then these are linked with certain kinds of action going on in the brain. So that, that's what my PhD is in, but I was looking at, um, different, uh, brain activity in waves that's going on whilst practicing or whilst learning mindfulness, um, which was, it was really interesting and it got me involved in in learning how to 
practice. Uh, I now do that with a lot of my clients. And I'd love to talk about actually some of the motions, some of the, while you see it as dancing, I see it as Tai Chi that Arthur does quite a lot during the film. So that that was very interesting to see how he potentially is using that as an emotion regulation strategy, I would argue. But you see it's very different. So that's a bit of a bias. Mm. Um, but in terms of thinking about the, the brain injury stuff, I think it definitely does look like it's some sort of maybe frontal lobe issue in that you thinking about his ability to work through a problem, being able to regulate his emotions, being able to kind of balance those um deeper areas of the brain and again with with trauma like he's gonna have such a fired up amygdala you're like your threat center that's going to be firing all the time and then if you've also got um so some damage there so that you actually find it very difficult to to regulate those areas I, i can see how that would be that would be an issue but um yeah annoyingly i'm i'm not the kind of neuroscientist that can necessarily <laughs> that's fine so i think there's that there is there's a disorder called uh involuntary emotional expression disorder um, yeah also a uh, pseudobulbar affect so it's basically involuntary uh laughing um that's precipitated by a feeling of nervousness or anxiety and it doesn't and correlate with your actual feelings right it's no not at all and you can have it if you have traumatic brain injury but also things like parkinson's and lots of other sort of conditions can end up leading to that and i guess it must mm. be some sort of degradation again not my area mm. Mm. but i think that um because those kind of episodes are often triggered by an event that actually doesn't always have massive emotional relevance it can just be something quite minor just a feeling of discomfort Mm -hmm. it can have this huge impact on people who are living with that condition because it's embarrassing and it then leads to withdrawal and it leads to social isolation and he's Mm -hmm. and that's just you can watch that cycle with him can't you where he's already massively withdrawn Mm -hmm. from other people and his quirks and his, he's got no insight. So again, the kind of potential frontal lobe damage there, but there's definitely no insight. And then that just alienates him from people further. And then he doesn't get the mm-hmm. opportunity to learn social skills mm-hmm. or to meet with other people. And so he mm-hmm. just gets further and further isolated. You're kind of watching him in the film. He just has nobody. No. And I was actually really interested where, um, because his, his adoptive mother was in hospital for a certain amount of time. And there was a lot of discussion around the abuse that he'd, experienced whilst was adopted by her I was also really curious well where did he go during that yes. time yes. so there's probably also been a lot of movement in his life so he's probably been quite a socially awkward child at school not really being able to make those social connections with others and then probably moved several times and then he's then gone back to his um adoptive mother at some point but he seems to have no memory of all of this stuff which i'm assuming is an adaptive way of kind of blocking that out because of the amount of trauma he's experienced but i don't know no it's it's, very complicated i wanted to know so much more about his backstory considering this is a, a film all about his backstory i still want to know more about his historical backstory <laughs> yeah absolutely i'm exactly the same so did did he did he go into care did he go into foster care has he ever had a nurturing mm. figure in his life because clearly his mother never has been she he mm. says that she says that he was put here to spread joy and laughter but then equally she then says to him when he's helping her in the bath what makes you think you could be a stand up you don't you have to be funny so yeah. she's always putting him down but then he also says that she told him to smile and put on a happy face, which kind of speaks of some kind of toxic positivity, potentially, if mm-hmm. if that was there, that kind of pushing down of your emotions, don't feel. All in all, he just wants to be accepted, doesn't he? He wants to be fathered. He wants to be nurtured. So he reaches mm-hmm. out in these fantasies to, um, to Murray Franklin with this idea that he could be somebody, want, somebody mm-hmm. could be my father is that kind of feeling yeah. you get from him. He just wants somebody to look after him because he's doing all the caring strangely mm-hmm. for this person who's really rejecting of him mm-hmm. i think that's the part of the wonderful thing about the film is that he's a he's so much a product of of everything and i'm sure we'll, we'll come on to talk about that but it's he's a product of of so many failures um throughout throughout society yeah 
yeah and the system absolutely yeah. yeah and it does give us that really interesting focus on on this being very much potentially as much nurture as it is nature or physical brain damage that you can mm. see that you know there isn't this idea that actually he's inherited this necessarily there's none of that it's really clear and in fact you know as as, as he even says himself this is this is about society this is about the way he's being treated by people throughout his mm. whole life that's what's that's the bottom line of this and it's almost that it's not about psychology it's about sociology I mean is any film ever not about sociology if it is about psychology yeah but it's the social the social side of it is massive in this film massive massive and I I, I find it interesting to think of like yes he has his own brain injury he has his own mental health struggles but then I think it's quite nice that it feels like you can see that side being completely separate to his developing criminality and that being really clearly quite a, an adaptive response to a completely broken society. Yeah. I mean, we, we know that people who experience serious issues with their mental health, they're more likely to harm themselves than others. And I think that is actually made really clear in this film that he has a lot of suicidality but then the violence that he lashes out onto others with, it really does feel like, do you know what? This is just, he, he's realizing over time that there's going to be no repercussions if he lashes out. If he defends himself, there will not be any repercussions. Yeah. Bit by bit it happens, doesn't it? Yeah. Sure. Like the, the, the fact that he really legs it after he's, after he's shot, the three guys on the train, mm. he runs and he hides. And then when he steals his uh, mother's records from the institution, he runs a little bit, but then he hangs out in the stairs reading it. Like he's he's slowly picking up on the fact that like, do you know what? I can do whatever I want because that's how everyone else is here. So yeah. uh, he, he's almost like adaptively shifting because of this broken society. And I think it's quite nice that they can separate that in this film. Or at least that's why I was watching it. Mm -hmm. And he definitely, I mean, as as psychologists, we have, and, as, and I, I'm pretty in the same boat as me, I'm assuming you too have issues with labels and diagnoses and things like that, because as psychologists, we tend to want to formulate and ask mm -hmm. what's happened to you rather than what's wrong with you, what's your label. Mm. But he definitely has these quite bizarre possibly almost psychotic levels of fantasy life yeah which come out in the film the whole thing with murray is the first glimmer of it but then as we discover his whole life with um sophie from flat b or the flat down the corridor mm. there's there's something there this this you know this this fantasy world and whether it's just a part of his depression or whether it's mm. part of again his developmental trauma where he's just disassociating and trying to find somewhere else to to be it's yeah. it's hard to know but there's definitely yeah it definitely has difficulties with his mental health and has clearly had them for some time yeah so I, I i would agree i think um you know if you want to get down to the chemistry of it it does seem like there's a a heightened amount of dopamine potentially this idea that he does kind of um you start hearing him talk about his personal reference to things becoming stronger was it there was a he was listening to something on the radio and they were using the his stage name um as a clown and then yeah. he's talking again with his with his social worker who he calls his therapist i don't know if that's a uk versus american thing or if um I, I, think, I think again yeah, he's been I, failed by the system hasn't he if, if that's his version of a therapist is his social worker and also that's the system failing the social worker because that's not what she's trained in well not necessarily I think in, in America my understanding is that social workers you can be like a therapeutic social worker so you might give counseling and therapy especially for somebody who might have been discharged from an inpatient unit I think okay um, right. But equally, she is definitely let down by the system anyway when mm -hmm. the funding is cut. So he definitely has... So, yeah, he's definitely presenting oddly right from the beginning. And we also mm -hmm. see him... He doesn't seem to understand humour. If you see, he actually is writing down what makes a stand-up mm -hmm. comedian funny. 
and trying yeah. to kind of figure that out. So there's definitely this disconnect between him and people. Mm. And the one person he is supposed to be connecting with, as you say, is this therapist who just does, doesn't pick up any of those red flags that we've talked about at all. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. And she, in fact, she seems to she seems to just be very care like she doesn't really care about him at all. Take thoughts. Yeah, very much the thing. Yeah. It's like right, yeah, okay, you're struggling. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, we've been over this. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. No sympathy yeah. given. Yeah, and he says you ask the same questions every week. You don't listen, mm. and and actually, if you look at him, I think he's trying really hard. Because if you, you know, from the point of view of somebody who was seeing somebody in a therapy setting like this, he's trying really hard to hold on to his job. Yeah. He's he's caring for his mother and doesn't seem to get much support at all for that. Mm-hmm. He's going to this these therapy sessions. He does his homework. He writes mm-hmm. in his journal. He shows it to her. She doesn't pick up on any of the many red flags in that. He mm-hmm. asks for more medication because he doesn't feel like it's working. And everything, nothing, nothing is done. Nothing is done to help him. And in fact, if anything, mm-hmm. it's taken away. And she mm-hmm. says at one point, you're on seven medications. Um, surely they must be doing something. As if- oh, my God. Then he needs a medication review. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> poor guy, if none seven. of them are working, take him off some of them. <laughs> Yes, but possibly not all at the same time because no. he cut his funding and now he has absolutely nothing. He has no social worker. As you say, the social worker is also let down yeah. by the system. Yeah. But, you know, and he asks where he's going to get his meds from and she just says, I'm sorry. So does that literally mean that this, this man has come off seven different types of medication, one possibly for the consequences of a traumatic brain injury? Yeah. And he's left with absolutely nothing. And actually one of the things he says is, all I have are negative thoughts. And for me, that just yeah. kind of, that shouts classic CBT issues right there. That's <laughs> that kind of idea of like, so let's talk about your negative thoughts. Now let's try and turn those into some positives. Let's, you yeah. know, let's talk about how sad it is that it's raining, but we'll talk about, you know, how awful that feels, but let's see if we can put a positive spin on it. That's just not how therapy works. That's not how human beings work. No, no. And I, I love how like, cause we've, we've had discussions about CBT, so cognitive behavior therapy. Thank you. And this idea that, yeah, you need to reframe any positive thoughts and how actually like what I love about your profession is that you get taught how to completely embody so many different kinds of emotion, but that they're all, they're all good. They're all useful. Um, but let's learn how to step into them and then step out of them as well i I think part of the part of the training and part of the the working as an actor is that especially in theater is that you need to be able to fully engage with that emotion and those those feelings and those thoughts and then the director says cut and you go sorry what you you come straight out of it yeah like why did you stop me at that moment all right okay you know you you, and then you have to go straight back into it um so i think it that is very difficult in order to like get that get that down be able to do that so it is yeah it is it is a challenge but, but it's, it's part of the job but it, it's interesting how like you need to be so incredibly emotionally intelligent but also com- emotionally accepting to do that and i think that's what he's not had from from any of the you know uh, either a social worker or any other sort of modeling figure in his life he's never been taught that it's all right to be sad to have negative thoughts he's living in a really awful situation, of course he's only got negative thoughts. That's that's a sane person's response. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, but that should be useful information to then be able to wield mm-hmm. as opposed to like trying to block it all out. That's almost the scariest part of it is that all of the, the things, well, not, not all, but a lot of the things that he finds himself doing are perfectly like, acceptable not necessarily acceptable but very normal responses mm. to it's all the very situation. understandable yeah. yeah so you it goes out to that kind of idea um in compassion focused therapy where it's not your fault and to a point mm. and i would make that very very clear that i think we would all agree that it's to a point this isn't his fault right up until the point where he actually probably accepts the gun none of this yeah. was his fault none of this is all the the understandable response of our tricky brains that we have plus 
this you know horrible history that he's had and if he was you know as they do in in um cft in this compassion focused therapy mm. one of the questions you sometimes ask is what do you think would have happened how would you be if you'd been brought up by the family next door mm. and that'd be fascinating who would he have been if he hadn't have been potentially adopted or if he had been adopted by somebody who was stable and who didn't let their partners beat up beat him up and hurt him and abuse him mm. you know he wouldn't have been this person this person has been created and then he's got this brain you know, because we all have this brain that just focuses on the negative, mm. that actually doesn't, he does nothing for himself. There's nothing in his life that's self-soothing, that's self-compassionate. It's all either drive, because he's just focusing on getting through the day, working, mm. or it's his threat system, which is huge, mm. because he's just constantly under threat, as a lot of people are in Gotham, but him especially, he's just, he is victimised all the time. So, He's well out of balance. He doesn't have any of that last sort of circle that you need. So if you have your threat circle and you have your drive circle, you also need to have your self-compassion circle. You need to have yeah. that element. And he's got nothing. Nobody's ever taught him that. And that's what the therapy could, should be doing. And it's yeah. not. All she does is like, does it help to have somebody to talk to? She asks him, <laughs> no. Funnily enough, no. Not just talking to you and saying, yes, I feel rubbish. That's not helpful. Yeah. But then arguably some of his hallucinations or delusions then do have a really useful, compassionate element to them. They are what activates his soothing system. When he has this wonderful, meaningful hug with his fantasy Murray who who accepts him, that's that's wonderful. And then he has this he believes to be having a, a romantic relationship with his neighbor again that's incredibly soothing during a really difficult time for him she came and sat next to him in the hospital when his mum was taken in it's... she was supportive as well like she came to see theoretically came to see his show uh-huh um yeah. like she was standing next to him at the news agents just like just there just 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 there beside him it's quite nice and that you don't need to do anything you don't need to fix anything you just need to be there hmm. yeah so again, it comes down to this idea that what if, just what if he had one person in his life, a real yeah. genuine friend, a real genuine person to look after him, but he doesn't. And I think, I think that again, that seems to be in the Gotham world, that society where people are all having to focus on themselves because again, that rich poor divide and, mm. and the fact that, you know, I think, I think everything is messy right from the beginning of the film, because there's a the garbage guys are on strike, aren't they? And then this is mm. led to super rats and, you know, this the, the whole premise behind it, everything behind Joker that's going on and the scenery in the background is is a kind of, what would that be, like a macrocosm of what's going on in his life, in mm. his head, that the garbage hasn't been taken out by anybody and just everything that's awful is just getting bigger. Mm. I like how that opening scene that opening shot as well really encompasses the whole film with like you said like with the super rats going on the radio you've got the um the landscape in the background the bridge like the it sort of sets the scene and focuses you in it's got the uh, the easter egg thing as well of of like it's got the um image of batman as well in the mirror um super, like uh, above him looking over him um mm-hmm. yeah it's really like well constructed all the parts of that that initial shot. Mm. Yeah. For sure. Mm. But then also the backdrop of, I mean, the stairs are so iconic, I think, in this film. But they feel like such a well-lit metaphor. Of like the, the daily trudge of right now, we've got to go up these stairs when I finish work. And then, and then towards the end, on the flip side, having that, him dancing down the stairs. Mm. Sort of like shows that a uh, flick has been switched how do you how do you see that as um different from say because i remember you commenting on this in parasite as well which again i think is a really lovely like social commentary film but in them in parasite there is also all the stairs that the family has to go up every single day but in that it was almost like you go up the stairs up to this heavenly bliss above the dirt of the rest of the city whereas this felt almost the opposite it's like you've got to go up and that's where he lives but it's it's a drudge whereas he was dancing down 
you kind of you you've encapsulated it there. Oh, <laughs> I talk too long. <laughs> no, no, it's all right. It's all right. Yeah, like in in Barry and Parasite, it was was really interesting because it's very literal. Like they've got to go up the stairs to the nice place, and then they come back down the stairs to the the horrible one. Mm. Whereas in this one, that yeah, like you said, they they have flipped it. Mm. Um, in in order to enable the dancing in in that scene and for us to all witness and and sort of look in and mm. sort of understand what it's what it's saying you I were telling me earlier that that was all just ad lib that was made up so the the initial dancing um when he shoots the the three guys um he was supposed to go just go and lock himself away and like hide a gun um but the uh, the Joker? No, sorry, no, not the Joker. Um, Joaquin Phoenix and Todd Phillips, the director, who also directed like old school and and like some comedies like that, and the first Hangover, <laughs> um, which you like, it's a crazy jump between them, um, but very well done. Um, he, yeah, they they, they went into um, the, the the set and they were just trying to figure out exactly how they were going to do it, how they were going to do this scene, um, which I think is really wonderful the way that they yeah. they were able to just almost improvise things um, on the day because with filming and shooting, it's so like so regimented, like you've got 10 minutes, you've got to do this, right, boom, boom, boom. And everything is costed out, um, especially like for a director. Uh, okay, he's got a bigger budget, but nonetheless, for them to take the time in order to every day chat through every little, little thing they're going to do, um, I thought was was really cool, but in the in this scene initially, um, Todd just played uh, played Joaquin some some of the music from the soundtrack that had just been written, like just been written for the for the film, um, and they were sort of trying to figure out what to do with the music, um, and Joaquin just started dancing, and then it became just like more and more and more uh, elegant. And apparently that, that was all they needed. They were like, right, we're going to start, we're going to start shooting there. And then we're going to just go with your improvisation, which is outrageous to improvise a dance for screen. I mean, like that improvising dancing anyway is for, well, for me really hard for some people, for a lot of dancing things, it's, it's great. It's really easy. But um, yeah, for me, I find it really difficult, but um, that side. <laughs> uh, so, so we learnt salsa together, and uh, you you are great at it, but you really struggle with the improv bit. Yeah, because I, I have to make it up. Like, <laughs> I, I, I have to know what I'm going to do with my next like, step every moment. <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to do. He's always ranting about the fact that salsa is easier for girls because we just follow. We just have to relax enough to follow, whereas you have to be enjoying the dancing. I have but to plan, like three plan. moves ahead. Yeah, I've got to know. <laughs> so yeah, you you could not have improvised this scene, I'm sure. <laughs> Although to be I, fair, I think this... acting in other ways. But this. <laughs> There's something about the way that he's doing it and there's nobody else he needs to worry about and it's entirely his own space and his own yeah. decisions. But actually, when you look at that bathroom scene, I think in that first scene, he his movements look more like a puppet. So they look more like yeah. he's being pulled and pushed by these mm. unseen forces and twisted. His body's twisting a lot more. And then when he's on the stairs, there's a freedom to his dancing. It's more confident. His head is high. He's Absolutely. enjoying it. It's a completely different person coming down mm. those stairs than was in that bathroom. And I think that's something about that metamorphosis that he has from being moved by society to deciding, you know, screw this. I'm just going to do this my own way because yeah. why the hell not, basically? Because this is the thing with him, isn't it? It's that he's been his first killing. So first of all, he, he's beaten up. And that wasn't his fault the first time. And he was blamed for it. And he ultimately mm. lost his job. He was asked to replace the sign, for goodness sake. And then he's beaten up again. He didn't want to take the gun. He tried to say, I'm not allowed this. Yeah. And he defends himself. And so actually, right up until that point where he's in the bathroom, it, it isn't in his control. Mm. It is it is that impulsivity. Yes, absolutely. Especially chasing the last guy down. But for me, that dance in the bathroom kind of reflects this, this he's been pulled to this position. Mm. And then he decides that he's going to go the rest of the way entirely on his own. 
Uh, I think it's remarkable that he can that you you can get that from from his actions, considering that it was improv, like completely. Yeah. yeah. But I think that just shows how much he was able to step into this character. Absolutely, absolutely, and like there's there's um, things of Joaquin Phoenix and, and Todd Phillips chatting, and they're like, I from what they say, it sounds like there's no way that they could have could have done this film if they weren't there at that moment. It would be a very different film if they shot it like a month later, or mm. with with one factor different. Mm. Mm. But I do I think that's interesting because I. I think I have a background in mindfulness. I also have a background in karate. And I saw that scene and instantly I was like, yep, that's Tai Chi. I bet he learned that when he was in an inpatient unit. And that's a way that he knows of how to calm himself when he's stressed. Whereas you were like, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, and, to and be fair, you're... Kid, you're... Okay. Yeah. You're giving the Arkham Asylum a, a lot of credit for, I think for, their, so. for their Tai Chi program, which <laughs> at some point. Yeah, they've I mean, got no funding for any other sort of social services, but they've got a really great yoga and Tai Chi teacher. They've got a spa in there. <laughs> <laughs> no wonder he felt better when he was inside. Exactly. And then actually, this is the thing that he has c- c- gone from in there, he comes out. We don't know how long he's been out, do we, actually, when we start no. the film. And he talks about um, one of the things he says is everybody just yells and screams at each other and nobody's civil anymore and nobody thinks about what it's like to be the other guy. Mm. So, and actually, I think that we were saying at the beginning that this, you know, there's never, a, it always seems really poignant every time this comes out. And actually, even more now i mean yeah. over the last couple of years the amount of the amount of cases you see online of people who clearly just aren't considering what it's like to be the other person who is mm. being filmed or in the situation that they're in there's this mm-hmm. this real inward looking mm. in i don't know maybe i'm just feeling a bit negative today but it's this whole kind of like actually how does this affect me i'm the important one here yeah and I, and also around the uh divide between rich and poor there's been a lot of discussion i think we're both relatively youngish people still thinking about getting on the property ladder for example and trying to have those discussions with our parents about how hard that is to save up for a mortgage um for the deposit but also how much a bank will just give us for a mortgage because even though if we'll pay a, a grand in rent they'll only give us a mortgage for say 500 pounds a month um, and uh, there's this lack of understanding between socioeconomic groups and uh, mm-hmm. it does feel like the divide's getting worse but there's also been a lot of research hasn't there about how it's not necessarily um, on average you know how that what the divide is but it's how close you are to those who have a huge contrast to you. If you physically, you can see those people who have so much more, that's when you get a lot more social unrest and you can definitely see how that's happened in somewhere like Gotham. Is that not why these more of these stories are being told at the minute because they're poignant mm. for right now, for audiences that, that can engage with it directly? Yeah. And go, oh yeah, I can see myself in that. Yeah. But also the fact, I think things like social media as well, like we're now, all of us are closer to those who have so much more than we do because Mm -hmm. we can see them on our phone whenever we like. Mm. Yeah. And if the last year has taught us anything, it's that if you've got a lot of money, you can make more from a crisis. Yeah. And if you don't have a lot of money, it's harder to keep your head above water in times like this when it shouldn't be. This should be a point where everybody pulls together and and you know the people who have a lot give a lot but actually mm. given the statistics on how many people in the top sort of one percent or so have made vast quantities of money over mm. the last 18 months or so it's striking that actually it's easier to just keep on making money when you've got it yeah. and then potentially rather than sending it down <laughs> you you set it up and go into space. I don't know, something like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not mentioning any names. Yeah. Yeah. No, no names. Yeah. I don't need to. There are so many of them doing yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> but it's interesting, I think, how um, the Joker, it seems like, because there's been many Jokers over the years, they they do represent what um, 
what we fear maybe at the time. And this Joker definitely feels like it's linking to this idea that when you have socially isolated men, they have access to a gun. What happens? They incite violence and they kill. Um, whereas before the Joker has been um, a relatively like effeminate character in the past to that very stereotypical strong jawed Batman, you know, when that was, that was the thing um, in uh, Heath Ledger's, he was kind of this criminal genius. Um, I think did, we, there I think there was a lot of talk then around sort of the rise of people's understanding of psychopathy, for example, and yeah. sort of yeah. what that cold calculating mind can do. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, the same problem with that film. I mean, love Heath Ledger's. Oh, absolutely yeah. love it but again same problem somebody who is mentally ill becoming somebody who is therefore violent and mm. whereas actually I think it's it's very easy to, to have that for that criticism to be leveled at this film but actually one of the things that so many little elements of it are just these sparkling diamonds of, of important information so when he says things like the worst part about having a mental illness is that people expect you to behave as if you don't and he's yeah. writing it as if it's a joke and that's not a joke. That's poignant. That's real. That's sad. That is exactly what, what this is about. So it's like they've developed this character. I think it's really interesting that you say that there's this kind of almost an, an, an effeminate next to Batman's masculine, because actually there's this, this idea that actually perhaps it, that, that is the ultimate love story is Joker and Batman. But it's mm. not Joker and Harley Quinn. It's always been Batman that he's actually loves, basically. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because I think inside jo- oh, this Joker, definitely, there's a really scared little boy who was never given that secure base, never had that that caregiver who would give them, you know, direct boundaries, but cared and had a moral compass. So I can completely yeah. understand why he would love and actually look up to someone like Batman in the end and try and push his buttons because that's what a child always does to their father. Um, but wants to know where the, where the lines are. Um, but also, but look yeah. at that similarity between them. Now, if you look at this film, you've potentially got two people who have come from um, families where they've lost their parents and, mm-hmm. and have had to bring themselves up to an extent. Mm-hmm. And actually in, um, there's a, there's an animation called the killing joke. It's based on a comic of the same name. And there's a line in it where Joker says um, to Batman, all it takes is one bad day. And he's saying that that's the difference that between him and Batman, one bad day. Hmm. And that's what makes Joker as opposed to what makes somebody Batman. And in fact, interestingly, he says that to uh, Sophie from Apartment B. When she asks him to leave, he says, I've had a bad day. And I just mm. I can't help wondering if there's something there um, that that was put there on purpose, because I think... It is, it's true, he's had a really bad day. He's had several, many really bad days. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And oh, I mean, also, it's a it's a comic book film. They love their little odes to oh, yes. other things that people, and lots of little nods that people won't get. Like, there is that, but also I think um, when they when they went about making this film, they didn't they didn't do it with with that necessarily at the front of their mind, at least. They went, they, they, the director went into it with the aim of like, we're going to make a character study that people want to watch, you know, mm. but it just happens to be Joker um, and have that, that backstory and all the, um, all the expectations of what's to come and things too. Mm. But mm. very much so. You're right. Mm. It's well, it, they, I think they succeeded as a character study. <laughs> I think so. But I was I well, one of the things I really enjoyed about watching it was that anyone could have been Joker. It feels in terms of like the the Joker character who became a symbol for societal unrest. It really felt like Arthur Fleck was just in a particular place at a particular time, um, and then it it spoke to a lot of people who just ran with it. And I re- exactly. I do like that element of it. It's like the, 
the fact that he became Joker in this suggestion this that, symbol. Yeah, that he's become yeah. a symbol. Mm. Um, that was purely by accident. Like, at and the he start says, of the film, there's no way that he'd have ever, in his wildest dreams, have, have thought that he was going to end up on top of a car with all those people around him right at the end of the film. Mm. Like, it's, it's but he that. also says he doesn't believe in any of that. So society has latched on to this random act of killing of these guys on the train and they gave it, the media gave it this deeper meaning that it actually had. It was retaliation. He was, he was defending himself. He was being yeah. attacked. Yeah. And then the media said that it's the killer's jealousy of their status. And they called it kill the rich and they made him a hero. It wasn't about killing the rich actually at that point. And that's not to say that he didn't have a good reason to be, um, to just, this, He's basically disenfranchised and he has nothing. Mm. And the, the, there are people who have a lot. And one of those people is the, the, um, the Wayne family and what have you. But actually, he says to um, to Mary, I don't believe in any of that. that. That's not why I did it. That's, you know, as far as he's concerned, those people aren't his people. Mm. But then then obviously, as time goes by, perhaps they become his people. But it's interesting. Mm. I think there's something there, isn't there, about the way that people's behaviour is interpreted by the media and potentially given a lot more status and a lot more power yeah. than like you said, it deserves. It's becoming more and more poignant with mm-hmm. every day that passes, it seems. Mm. Yeah. But Absolutely. we like a story, don't we? Like, as people, we need to have an explanation for things and find meaning in every little moment absolutely yeah yeah Yeah. and to feel safe then because well at least there was a label put on it there was a label there's a narrative and that means that we know how to control it we know how to avoid it we know how to behave around it as well Uh uh-huh uh-huh yeah but i think actually actually that's yeah i think that's one of potentially the criticisms of it though isn't it that that's this idea that they're linking not only sort of linking the mental illness and and actually, to be honest, this idea that people are just one prescription or therapy appointment away from mass murder, because that's mm-hmm. basically what happens. Um, that in itself, as we've said, uh, you know, massively troubling, but also this idea that actually this explains why somebody might pick up a gun and might kill people, especially a wronged white man. And actually, yeah. I think that there's something there about the idea that this isn't, in this particular case, this isn't... A, a, an explanation, not an excuse. This explains why he did this. It doesn't make it okay that he did this. And I don't think there's ever anything in the film that says that this is okay. No. And that's when it does come back quite nicely to a lot of the sentiments around compassion focused therapy in that you've been born with this tricky brain, you've been born to this situation, that's not your fault, but you do have a choice. You do have the the strength and the power to decide how you want to go from here and yeah fair enough you don't know how to do that on your own but that's why we also have professionals and that's why we can help develop people's skills in how to move forward and 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 heal or to to just be aware that there's these things in us but then we can have a little bit of a pause between that first thought and then how we act yeah. If we can have that moment of pause, suddenly we can make that choice. It doesn't mean it feels like an easy choice, but there is one. I, I heard a, a really nice quote um, a couple of years back, and it was, never judge somebody by their first reaction. It's always the second. Mm. I, that, I, that I quite like, at least, um, which I think goes quite well with what you're saying there. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. So initially, if you go, oh, I don't like that, but then his second reaction is, well, no, but that's okay. Or, you know, whatever that is. Yeah. What's that about? Yeah. Or, like, um, I always think uh, uh, racism can be a good example of that. You know, there's a difference between the fact that we are born with a fusiform facial area that looks differently at faces from someone of the same race as you and someone who has a, is from a different race. So a fusiform facial area is more attuned to faces that look like yours. That's something that we're born with. So that first reaction, not our fault, that's what we're born with, but that fusiform facial area will also learn. So the more we interact with people from different 
groups, different cultural groups, different races, it starts to assimilate that into what it sees as a face and therefore part of our community. Mm. So we can learn. We just have to be open enough. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that that's what, you know, that, I mean, that's what we aim with with therapy, isn't it? This idea that, mm. that we, you need to be curious. You know, we we yeah. as therapists need to be curious. We want our clients to be curious. That That is the aim. Mm. And I think that looking at Joker and thinking, actually, the problem is that you are still sending him into an absolutely awful situation every single time he walks out of the therapy room door. Yeah. That that systemic element of the world that he's living in is is really hard for any therapist mm-hmm. to be able to work with because, you know, we can only go so far in helping people to be mindful and to, to be, <laughs> you know, be curious and be compassionate towards themselves. But actually, if you are being beaten up on a daily basis, actually, you know, there's there's some first aid that needs to be done, which is about just trying to maybe move away from Gotham and live somewhere yeah. else if you possibly can, because it, yeah. it's a pretty toxic environment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or, or get angry. Get angry in a constructive way, but yeah, do get angry. Yeah. Because this is wrong. <laughs> There's a lot that is wrong with this city. And when he, yeah, he, he says so many incredibly insightful things around, is it, is it me or is it getting crazier out there? Or yeah, you don't listen. Yeah. It, there's just a lack of empathy, I think, throughout this whole film. And it does feel like over the over the period of the film, he just learns to have a bit more insight about that. Like uh, he's been trying to abide by the rules and actually no one cares. Almost more accepting. Okay. And yeah. then be like, right, well, okay. I'm not gonna care either. That's the tra- that's the tragedy of it. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So what about that final scene? So in the final scene, he's being interviewed again and he genuinely laughs. It, it's a different laugh than the laugh that he's used throughout most of the film. He genuinely laughs and he says he's just thought of a joke, but she wouldn't get it. So what do you think that joke is? I don't completely know. I think because he walks out and he's got sort of blood on his feet and he's not chained anymore... Part of me wasn't sure if um, that was him laughing because he's realised how he's going to get out and he's going to be able to murder some more people on his way out of here. Mm -hmm. Um, And for him, I'm sure there's an incredibly funny pun that he came up about that, which I can't think of in this moment, which is really annoying. Um, But part of me was thinking that, yeah, I'm sure he found that incredibly funny somehow and realised that she definitely wasn't going to get it, but she'll find out soon enough. That was my sinister take on it. I, I, that's much more highbrow than mine. Mine was just going to be like something along the lines of just like well, something about society or something about that, about that or failing him and him just mm-hmm. being very honest. Mm-hmm. And then. You see, I thought that originally, but then I thought actually he's, a, again, going back to, to the, the race side of things, he's a white man telling a woman with black skin that she wouldn't get a joke about how society kicks people. I think she probably would, um, unless that's just the epitome of uh, his white male mentality. I don't know. Ah, uh, I hope that's that's the answer. That's much better. Yes. Or I have one other theory to put to you, and that mm. is that the joke is actually on the audience. So he is imagining the very last thing he's imagining in his head is watching Bruce Wayne standing next to his parents. But he never saw that. He can't have seen that because another Mm. one of the clowns did that. So what if he'd never got out of Arkham Asylum and what if the entire film had been the joke and the joke's on us as an audience? He's just imagined a whole scenario that could happen. Because he, we never know what's real. We never know what's in his head and what's his delusion. What if the whole thing was a delusion? Oh, I love that. Love that. We were having an argument just now, actually, before we had started the recording um, about this the scene before the last scene with him being in the back of the police car and then there being the crash and him being lifted out. And then you pointed out to me, oh, I didn't think that was real. I thought that yeah. was in his head. I was like, what? Yeah. What? The idea no. that he's, yeah, him standing on the car could easily be a delusion because why, why I mean, how, why, how why, would that why happen? Would they have, how would they have known which police car to hit? And yeah. exactly all, all those, 
multifarious yeah. factors. There's no way that they'd have been able to do that. No, and the fact that he he survived, the other people didn't. Yeah. But he's very badly hurt, and then stands on a car. Does yeah, really but it is a really good end to the film, and and but that that and that's a, that's the thing as well. So whenever we we talk about films, I it always comes back to, but it's a film. Yeah. So yeah, you have all all these all these um, like really interesting like reasons behind and like psychological like oh yeah, but this would happen, this would happen, and this would happen. Okay. But in order for the film to progress, then then that's why these ridiculous things may occur at moments. So I think perhaps it might be a <laughs> w- w- one of those. It's a really nice ending to the film. I mean, yeah, another I'm ending just... might be interesting of like him, the car being hit, and then that being it. For for but this a... is this is so much better. This is so much better because I love the idea that you then have to figure out what was the joke what is he thinking and I mean there's so mm-hmm. many little things that point I think now I I overlooked into it um it's things like the scene where he's talking to a social worker there's a clock on the wall behind him and the identical clock is in the asylum that he remembers being in when ah. he thinks about I prefer being in the asylum it's the same clock on the wall same place on the wall but that's in mm. the asylum and then he looks like he's in the same room again with the woman on the other side of a desk. And there's just things like that that just make me think, well, actually, also, also, he can't be Joker. Not really, because Bruce Wayne's too young for him to be Age. Bruce yeah. Wayne's Joker. So, But then so- Batman has, there's, there's several Batmans as well, isn't there? There's like There's Batman in the comics. You have Batman and then I think at some point Batman dies and I think it's either one of the Robins or it might be Batwing becomes a new Batman. There's all these, this legacy It is more of a name and the, the mask is the thing that means that anyone can take it on. So I guess actually it makes sense. It could be that there's more Jokers as well. Exactly. What if he's going to now go and tell that whole story to somebody in one of the other cells and they are the Joker? Yeah. Because then they go and kill the psychiatrist who becomes Harley Quinn and the whole thing starts like, who knows? I mean, oh. this is great because it opens potential doors to what's going to happen next because it's... And a wonderful franchise for the for the industry. <laughs> <laughs> If anyone's casting, then uh, I'm just going to put my, put my <laughs> <over> there. <laughs> what what, uh, what character would you like? My question too. Who would you be? Yeah. Obviously, obviously the Joker. Mm-hmm. That'd be it'd be so cool. Would you be the first half Indian Joker? <laughs> Don't that really matters, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that'd be great. As so long as you're not going to be a Robin, because I'm very disturbed by the amount of, well, frankly, quite young men that Batman manages to get killed while being his sidekick um, as time goes by. So, yeah, yeah, I'm really glad you didn't say Robin. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that'd be a very short stint. <laughs> whereas, whereas if, if I get cast as a Joker, then then there's, there's, there's films, films that you can be in, whereas Robin is more likely to be one. In and out. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Pretty much. Mm-hmm. What a reoccurring part. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We normally do a thing at the end of ours where we talk about one thing you would change. Mm. Okay. Um, I didn't know if if you had something that you would change in Joker. If you could. That is a really good question. I think... I think the curious psychologist in me would want to know more, have seen more about his childhood. Mm. I feel like I'm missing that information and it would just, and not that it would necessarily change an awful lot of my formulation or the way I see him, but I would have liked to have seen that. So that would be the only thing I think I would have changed would be to draw that out a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And what Mm -hmm. about you guys? What would you change if you could... I think the actor in me wants to wants just a, a, re, a close up shot, more close up shots of of Joaquin Phoenix in certain moments where you can just track his thoughts and his movements at every every point. That I want to see just lots of that throughout the film. Just just more put it in Wacken. wherever. More Wacken. More <laughs> Phoenix for you, Dave. Okay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. I think. I would want 
um, just a very short scene where after he's gone to his neighbor's apartment and says that he's had a bad day and it does feel like it leaves it very open as to what happened or didn't in that apartment before he left. Yeah. I would like to see the little girl. I'm not saying I want to see her fine, but I want to see her alive because I think there is something quite important in this Joker that he is not cruel to innocent people. Yeah, he doesn't hurt people who haven't hurt him. Yeah. That's really, really important. So I have always assumed that he didn't hurt her or her daughter because that's not not what he's done throughout the film. Yeah, so anyone and I, have I would him. agree. I would agree, but I worry. I do worry for Sophie because there were some pretty worrying images in his diary. And she rejected oh, they were. him. And she, yeah, exactly. She does reject him. Mm. Um, and that was his final bit of solace that he thought he had. So I do worry about her, but I would at least like to see, I'd like to see the daughter alive. Yeah. I think that would tie in well with who we see in him as a person. Interesting. That's great. Yeah. Guys, I think we've done Joker. Thank you very much for coming on with me today. Thank it's, you. It was really fun. Thank you so much for uh, for letting us, us chat and, and rant a bit with you. <laughs> <laughs> You've been listening to Analyze This, Mental Health and Film and TV. My guests today were the hosts of 3D's Character Assassination podcast, Dr. Sanger and Dave. Music for the podcast today is by Joseph McDade, post-production editing by David Woods. Please visit and follow me on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. I'd love to hear your ideas, your thoughts about future episodes and your opinion on any films and episodes that we've covered so far. Tell your friends and family about the podcast, spread the word, and don't forget to like and subscribe.